Let me start by saying that before this sequence of events, I was 100% a non-believer of the paranormal. I'm still in shock of what I witnessed yesterday. But I'll tell you the whole thing from the beginning. One month ago, in my apartment building, some weird noises started. It was like somebody was doing construction work on their flat. I didn't pay much attention. I figured somebody could be repairing stuff or something of that sort. It started on a Friday, and it was almost always in the afternoon, ending at like two or three in the morning. The weekend, the same thing. The morning was quiet, and then the rest of the day busy with a noise that was like somebody hammering or something. Everyone that was on the right side of the building, my side, was starting to get annoyed, mostly because everybody wanted to rest, to be able to work the next day. Of course, we started to try to find the location of the source, to pin this down to some singular apartment. There's also another building close to ours where the walls connect. I've gone to every apartment and put my ear near the lock, and there's almost no sound. The flat most affected is my upper neighbor, where she lives with her daughter. We thought maybe it could be the apartment above her making all this noise, even though the water supply is shut down, same with electricity, so logically nobody should be living there. But we had to be 100% sure. So we called the owner and asked her kindly to open the apartment so we could check to see if somebody was using it or had forced an entrance. No one was there, and the noise could be heard. It was coming from the apartment under where my neighbor above lives, so we ruled out that the inhabited apartment was the source. Time goes by and this phenomenon repeats every single day without missing. Bangs on the walls, bangs on every division of the apartment of my neighbor, on the furniture, things falling in the bathroom and the kitchen. Police were called three times, but of course they couldn't find anything. They entered this flat and they also heard the noise but they couldn't pinpoint where the sound was coming from. It also travels very fast, from the kitchen to the living room, etc. Also, in the corridor on the first floor, we started to bang on the wooden walls, and we would get replies from this unknown source. We would even ask questions, saying knock once for yes, knock twice for no, and we would get replies. Fast forward, and finally both my neighbor and her daughter went away for the weekend. Magically, the sound stopped. I didn't know this until yesterday. I just thought, finally, the noise went away. They returned yesterday. And guess what also returned? That's right, the knocking again. So I was in the corridor with both of my upper neighbors and another from the same corridor chatting. Both she and her daughter were outside the flat. Her daughter was playing with the other girl, the other neighbor's granddaughter, and by this time there were no noises. We were all just chilling. But later on, her daughter went inside to pick a doll to play with. We started hearing the knocks again. Every single time her daughter went inside, we would hear, after about three to five seconds, the knocking. So I asked my neighbor, can I go inside? And she replies, yes, of course. I went inside, full silence. I stood there for like 30 seconds, nothing. I came out and I asked my neighbor if she could go inside as well. She goes inside, zero knocks. We ask her daughter if she can go inside again and boom, knocking all over the place. I kid you not, this didn't miss and we did this like 10 or 12 times and every single time the daughter went inside, the knocking would start. Later on, other neighbors arrived on the corridor. We did the same process, and when the neighbors went inside, there were no noises. But when the daughter went in, full-blown knocks. I honestly don't know how to deal with or solve this situation. But after what I've witnessed, I'm 100% sure that this is something of the paranormal. I just don't know what. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. 
We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and, stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. 
the whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. First unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. Never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend Elle asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never set foot in our apartment prior 
commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. To start off, I haven't gotten much sleep over the past few months. My insomnia has gotten really bad, and my doctors act as if I'm medication-seeking whenever I ask for help. Anyway, the house that I'm in currently, I know for a fact, has some kind of beings living in this big hedge in the backyard. They've been seen all around the house, though. I saw one on a snowy day run from behind my neighbor's parked RV to behind one of those weird trees that looks like a bunch of skinny trees just growing from the same spot. I'm not sure the name of the specific type of tree, but the main point is that you can see through to the other side pretty easily between the little trunks. Anyway, I saw what appeared to be a fat little man, about a foot tall, run from the RV to behind the tree. So, without breaking eye contact with the tree, in case whatever it was ran, I walked over to see if I could find footprints or something, in case maybe it was a rabbit. I got to it, and of course, there were no footprints, nothing in the tree, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. I knew what it was, but I just decided to leave it be, and went back inside. A few months later, my little brother saw the same looking thing run in between two of the same types of trees that I mentioned earlier, just on the other side of my house. All he said was it looked like a tiny roundish man running, definitely on two legs, and again, no footprints. It was muddy that day, so if it had been an animal, there should have been footprints. It seems to me like they use those specific trees as some kind of portal or entryway to something. So that's the first being that I had questions about. The second has been happening a lot more recently, and is why I mentioned at first that I have insomnia, because that very well could be what the cause of this was. Our minds are fragile things when not being cared for properly after all. Within the last month or so, I have seen this thing in my living room. I sleep in my living room because I have too much anxiety to sleep in the back end of my house. I have babies, and if something were to happen, I feel like I wouldn't hear it. Both times I've seen this figure, I've been laying in bed trying to sleep. I'll roll over and look at my brick fireplace, and I'll see this tiny little humanoid type thing run for just a split second. But it's not fast. It seems like it's a slow motion echo of a child running. I'm not very good at describing these things, but I will try. It was transparent, but I could make out what seemed like bones. It honestly looked like an x-ray or an ultrasound of a child. 
It was like a sheer white color, like a ghostly skeleton in a way. It had a disproportionately large head and a tiny body. It couldn't have been more than 10 inches tall. As I mentioned before, it looked like I had just seen a slow motion flash of this thing running. It just kind of dissipated after I saw it. I've seen this thing twice in almost the same spot. The spots are maybe five to 10 inches away from each other. I saw it the first time almost a month ago and then last night as well. I was hesitant to tell this story because I had recently heard from people that talking about seeing dwarves or elves or fae will just piss them off. I don't really know. I just wanted to share the experience and ask if anybody has any idea about what this could be. I'm still thinking fae, but not sure. It doesn't feel bad. It seems more playful or curious, but I know things like this can easily deceive. Any input is appreciated. So, let me know if you have any ideas. I know that this story is a little vague, but it happened about a year and a half ago, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. I live in Alabama. Behind my house is a hill sloping downward and then up again. It's covered in woods for several acres. One day I heard a crunching sound outside, about 20 yards away from the back porch. I immediately went out and looked. It was in the middle of the day, and I saw three almost humanoid figures jumping up the far side of the hill. When I say jumping, they looked exactly like how deer look when they're kind of bounding up hills, but they were definitely not deer. They were all on two legs, going completely vertically up the hill. I couldn't make out any other kind of defining features, other than that they were kind of tan and white in color. I ran inside to get my wife, but of course they were gone by the time we got back out there. I haven't seen them since, but I do regularly hear strange sounds outside at night. And we've also had several yard signs and decorations that have ended up being inexplicably broken. I know the woods behind my house. I know what they look like, I know what they sound like. And this has just not been normal. In 2017, one of my good friends lived in Portland, Oregon. He was offered a job in Long Island, New York, and took it. He asked me to fly out so I could road trip with him across the country so he wouldn't be alone. Of course, I agreed and flew out from JFK to PDX. We have many stories from this road trip, but none stranger than what happened to us in Ohio. After a few days on the road, we had entered Ohio. I wish I remember exactly where this took place, but I honestly don't recall. All I know is that it was past Zanesville, heading east, where we had stayed the night before. My buddy was driving as I was reaching toward the ground, trying to grab my phone that I had dropped. He suddenly said, This old lady next to us keeps pointing at me. I think she wants me to pull over. I, always paranoid, said, F that dude, keep driving. But he pulled over. A black Escalade with plates from Alaska pulled in front of us. Out hopped a woman, no younger than 60, and said, I'm glad I got to you boys when I did. Your tires are smoking. It's important to note that we were towing his Camry with the U-Haul we were in. Side note, what happened in Zanesville was that we got stuck in the parking lot, couldn't back up, so we had to rehitch his car. We realized later he had left the emergency brakes on. Anyway... After she said this, we looked at each other, completely puzzled, and immediately at the tires. They were absolutely smoking, looking like they had bullet holes in them. 
This is where it gets strange. Not even a few seconds after we kneeled down to inspect the tires, she was gone. No goodbye, no sound of a car pulling off, just gone. The whole interaction from her getting out of the car to her vanishing couldn't have been more than 15 seconds in duration. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that she had literally vanished. My friend looked at me pale as a ghost, confirming exactly what I was thinking. I don't know for sure what would have happened if we hadn't stopped. I don't know if the car would have caught fire or anything else. But I do know that, real or not, to us she was an angel. I've tried to look into stories like this, but haven't had any luck finding anything. What do you think? When I was around eight years old, around 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a courtyard from my house, about a minute away. On the courtyard is a set of flats which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise, and I looked over my shoulder to see a typical film-like shaped spacecraft. The round disc-like shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can now only explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the day. The UFO is small, no bigger than about three feet and a foot and a half high. I think it's coming from me. At this point, I'm so scared I start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away, but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me, and the low humming is deafening. I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner, it's above my head, so close that the wind it created whipped up my hair. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. No visual sign of it, but I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and tell my mom and dad. They don't believe me and say I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day, and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that, but I can still remember it like it was yesterday, and I still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me, even though it was so small that there's no way I would have fit in it. I just can't explain the fear. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one, I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened but I know what I saw. Number two. This one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night we were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west. But then things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh, well, perhaps it was a plane Planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then it just disappeared. Just blinked out. Did I see a UFO?
I'm from Singapore. I was lying on the living room sofa in the dark, on my own, just flipping through Reddit on my phone. It was connected to the charger and the plug was right below the sofa, as I had the extension all the way. Then something got caught on the charger cable and the phone got pulled out of my hand and onto the floor. I couldn't see what was behind my phone while reading due to the light from it and the darkness in the background. At first I thought it might have just been my cat walking past, but she was asleep on my feet. The light that now illuminated the floor showed nothing. I thought I must have just gotten caught on something, so I brushed it off. Not ten seconds later, as I settled back onto the sofa, my phone got yanked right out of my hand again, and this time it flew a little farther away, as far as the USB cable could go. That area was now illuminated, but it too showed nothing. Nothing that could have caused the phone to be pulled that far anyway. Just an empty floor with nobody and nothing around. So I just moved into a new house a few weeks ago, which I previously thought was completely empty and unfurnished. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but I just got out of a pretty nasty situation in my old town and was looking for some seclusion. But from move-in day on, I have been hearing little knocks everywhere. I keep thinking it's kids playing in the woods, maybe throwing rocks at my house. But whenever I go look around outside, there's nobody there. I'm by myself out here, and I'm getting a little paranoid about people maybe following here from my old life. Always feels like someone's watching me. Last night, I heard a really loud thud in my attic, and I almost shit my pants. I was going to call the police, but then I started second-guessing whether or not I really heard it, because it wasn't followed by anything else, and there weren't any footsteps or anything like that. I was telling myself that it could have possibly been a squirrel that got caught up there, but it sounded more like a wooden beam had fallen on the attic floor. It was really loud and sounded dense. So after nearly sweating myself into a coma, I decided to actually go up there and check things out. When I get up there, it's dark and there's nothing. I spent a long time feeling around for anything that could have fallen, and finally, I see this box in the far corner of the room. I took it downstairs with me where I could actually see it, and it was really heavy. It's basically a big wooden box with a bunch of stick figures carved into it. I know there's something inside the box because I can hear it rattle when I move it. it sounds like there's more than one thing. The weirdest part is, though, there doesn't really seem to be a way to open it. There's no door or lid that I can open or find. There's no lock. It doesn't really have any crevices I can get my fingers in. There's just a bunch of carvings on it. Just stick figures, all doing kind of weird things. They look like they're dancing. Some look like they're holding hands. Does anybody know what this might be? I tried to Google some things, but I couldn't find anything. I kind of want to open it and see what's inside. I'm thinking of just breaking it, but I'm a little worried about what might happen if I do. What would you do? This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I just moved into a little house. Nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks, when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like when we went in there we disturbed some demon or spirit. Everyone who's gone up there has had a really bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember laying in bed. Everything was silent as a stone, and I was just peacefully watching TV. That's when I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, just paralyzed, 
I remember thinking to myself that I could get up, slowly, and check. Keep in mind I was only seven or eight at the time. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally persuaded myself to go check. It sounded like at least five people whispering, but as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing was, all my clothes were swaying back and forth. It couldn't have been wind because the window wasn't open, and I hadn't opened the door fast enough to cause any wind. I repeated it again just to make sure. This went on every single night for about two weeks, and then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night long and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, the things being out of place, that never quit. After a while, we just got used to it, but that's when things got worse. This one night, I had taken a shower and gone to bed as usual. No whispers, just straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described them as it looked as if something had gone inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but the things never really stopped. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store, and when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, it would have been nearly impossible for her to get in there anyway. After that occurred, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and eventually we moved out but we still don't know what we might have released from the attic. My father had training in Phoenix this week, so we left Las Vegas on Sunday and passed through Jerome for dinner. We didn't stay but we planned to pass through the town before, so we watched Ghost Adventures and did a tad bit of research on the hotel. The Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona is apparently haunted, and we thought that was kind of cool. We got to Jerome around 6 p.m. and went to the hotel to eat dinner at the Asylum restaurant inside. When we first got there, I had to use the restroom. Entering the male's bathroom closet to the restaurant, I walked into an empty bathroom with the three urinals out of order and just one stall near the very end. I supposed that they left the bathrooms the same from when it was a hospital since it looked like one of the blue and whitish old hospital rooms. Being in that bathroom gave me a very eerie feeling. Not hearing a sound made me constantly on alert for the unexplained footsteps or disembodied voices or breaths. I didn't notice anything except how much I was shaking, but when I finally exited the restroom, the unsettling feeling that I felt within carried throughout the rest of the building. We then just sat down for dinner about an hour or two and nothing weird happened during that. Then when we were finished with dinner at around 8pm, my dad wanted to get going because we needed to get to the hotel in Phoenix for his training that week, but I was desperate to at least check out the hotel part of the building and see room 23, supposedly the room with the most activity in the hotel. So before we left, we took a visit to the floor above the restaurant, and my father got a picture of me in front of the door to that room. After that, I decided to just pull out my phone and take some live pictures. I only took three, the first two being down the hallway from room 23, which had no weird anomalies in them and the final picture being just a quick one of the stairs closest to room 23 that led to the floor above. After that, we finally exited the building and went back to our ride to Phoenix. 
I didn't look at the photos directly after taking them, and only remembered to give them a look after I couldn't get any service a little while after exiting Jerome. That's when I saw the first two photos, and despite being a little disappointed that I didn't receive anything, finally came to the last photo I took real quick before I left, and I noticed what looked like an orb moving down the stairs. There have been stories of the spirit of a little girl roaming the property, and the orb moving in a hop-like pattern down the stairs seemed, in my opinion, to be a pretty childish gesture, as I commonly hopped down the stairs when I was younger. A few days after we visited Jerome, while we were sleeping at a hotel in Phoenix, I had just fallen asleep before I dramatically awoke after dreaming, or visualizing, the image of electricity slowly moving through a solenoid. Before reaching a core, which then caused me to wake up. It had the similar feeling of when you wake up from that feeling of falling, but this felt a little different. I'm not sure if it's related to my time at the Jerome Grand Hotel, due to the fact that I haven't experienced anything else, but I thought I would share it anyway, just in case. very strange babysitting experience the other night. Everything was normal until the kids were in bed. One of the kids kept running around, but finally they were down. And so I was just scrolling through random videos on Instagram to pass the time. I was watching one and I heard something. It was like a man or one of the boys pretending to have a deep voice was upstairs. It just said, no or something like that in this weird, crowley voice. I was confused and a little spooked, but I brushed it off and sat on the couch to watch a movie. Their dog was walking around and growling at the windows that led to the backyard. That creeped me out too, but I tried to brush that off. I thought maybe the dog had seen a squirrel or something. At this point, it's about 10 p.m. The dog was laying on my lap and started growling and barking toward the kitchen. At this point, I was like, you better cut that out, because who on earth wouldn't be creeped out by that? Later, I heard these incredibly light, whispery voices, like children. I wasn't completely sure if it was just the kids waking up and making noises, but it only lasted a moment after I noticed. I didn't even have time to go up and check. I noticed all these weird things, but I didn't really put them all together until later that night. I talked to my mom, and she told me that my sister and her friend had babysat there as well, and they both had odd experiences. Bad vibes, the kid telling her she'd seen some things, and the kids actually addressing something that wasn't there. My mom didn't tell me before I went over so that I wouldn't be spooked, which I guess was good because I got an independent witness of whatever happened without being influenced by the experiences of others. Anyway, I'll still go back to babysit. I'll just be prepared to throw hands with Casper if I have to, I guess. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. 
This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs. But he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek, and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story too implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on. A pulpit, I think, is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. 
Two of us came with firearms, and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large, jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous, jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small, scattered stones laid upon by long-fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash at the trailhead, this high-up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low-hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We assessed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure, Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark, but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake. I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, 
who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery, and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law, who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that day. He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him, and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere. The men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia, 
There is much to be uncovered, and there is even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature, an isolated mountain range with an ancient soul wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. At the time that this happened, I was 20 years old. I'm a female, and I had just moved alone to a small town in upstate New York. I had grown up in another, slightly larger town, about 60 miles away. I just wanted a new start. I love camping, and I often go camping in the Adirondacks. But at the time, I hadn't yet made friends to go camping with, so I wasn't going to go into the real woods alone. Down the road from me, I had been walking and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right of the house where I thought people wouldn't mind if I walked up the trail that the power lines make. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the US they keep the power lines clear in case maintenance is necessary. So I wander up there, noticing how it's actually pretty deep in the woods and I can get far enough from the house that I saw on the road that they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in or anything. I had an idea. I could go camping up here. It's secluded enough to give the real woods experience, but close enough to the road and with a direct path that I wouldn't be in real danger of wildlife or anything. Okay, sweet. So I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I accessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines then turned left onto what seemed to be a deer trail. Deer are everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this really nice, flat, grassy clearing. I built my fire off to the side after making sure to clear the dead woods. I'm feeling really smart and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, as I had always had at least one camping companion. But, eh, whatever. Next day, I decided to wander farther down the path to see where it led. I walked for about a half an hour, and I could see some fields on the right, but they were in the distance, and there was a fence between the fields and the path. So again, I figure people can't be mad at me for being where I am. Then I come across another path, heading to the right. I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly, and there's an old van on the left of the path, well, that's strange, but it's about 1 p.m., somewhere near noon anyway, broad daylight, birds are chirping, so I feel no danger. I go up to the van, which had obviously been there a very long time. It was 70s style and made me think of the Scooby-Doo van, and it was overgrown with weeds. There were streaks of brownish red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I looked in and saw what appeared to be old bedding in the back, but it was all shredded. The curtains on the windows were shredded, and the clothing was all strewn about, and it looked like it was from the 70s or early 80s. I still felt no danger signs. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continued along the path for a short time, until I finished rounding the slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks. Finally, finally, my reptile sense, or whatever you want to call it, 
wakes up and starts screaming at me full volume. Up ahead, there's a creepy doll hanging from the trees by its neck with a rope, not just stuck into the trees. Just to the left of that, there's an old garage overgrown with weeds. To the right of it though, there's this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-sized man. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects, just kind of welded together. Some were up and down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through, not that I tried. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Farther behind it, there's a rundown house. Creeped out as all hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner. I was a chunky girl and I had smoked for six years at that point, and I did not run, but I ran that day. I don't even remember the run. I just remember coming upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put my things into the tent, ripping it out of the ground as I continued running. I left my cooler, my food, anything that fell out behind. I never went back for it either. I dropped the tent stake somewhere along the way, and I had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down the hill, I'm still surprised I didn't break my neck, jumped in my car, and sped home. I locked all my doors, and then paced my house for hours, going, what the hell? What the hell? It's been 11 years since that incident, and even telling it now makes me a little shaky. I now live almost 1,400 miles away, but I still make sure my doors are locked. The crazy thing is, this wasn't even deep in the woods. Maybe in the 70s it was, though. Who knows? As it stands now, though, there are people living within a very short distance of this place. And no, I didn't call the cops. I can't really articulate why. My best analysis, looking back, is that I didn't want that creep to come find me. I probably should have called, yes. I'm hoping that it was just an old crime scene, not some sick person who still keeps people in cages in the woods. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was eight. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head, as if they were right behind my ear. 
but it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more, and when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night, and that it was a really serious thing, because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself but we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions 
had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically, and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything. They were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. This happened back in August of 2017, right before my second deployment. My best friend from high school, Kyle, and his girlfriend, Taylor, came out to New Mexico to visit my family and I. We decided a camping trip would be nice, but my kids were too young to do the whole tent thing. At the time, my oldest was three and my youngest was 18 months. We elected to rent a cabin at a campground in Weed, New Mexico, called Camp of the Tall Pines. We chose the biggest cabin that they had. If you want to rent it yourself, it's called Pooh's Corner. It's a two-bedroom cabin with a bathroom and living room with a good-sized fireplace. The fireplace has a cast iron door with a locking handle. The day we got there, we noticed that there was an old CRT TV with a satellite box hooked up to it. There was no DC cable for the box, so Kyle and I decided to run to the nearby town of Cloudcroft to see if we could find one. We figured it would give the kids something to do before they fell asleep and all that. We got back to the cabin a couple of hours later, and my wife asked me why I had come back to the cabin for roughly 30 minutes after I had left. She said that she heard me come in, rummage like I was looking for something, singing to myself, which I often do, and then I left again. But the problem is, I had never come back. In fact, at the time that she heard this, I would have been pulling into Cloudcroft. Things got a little crazy that night after we all went to bed. I had been working on building a fire in the fireplace that night, and had been decidedly unsuccessful. There was a little fire going, but nothing that would keep me warm. I gave up, and we all went to bed. I had a fan on me. I'm one of those guys that just can't sleep without a fan. My wife was in bed with me and we heard this bumping sound coming from Kyle and Taylor's room. I figured Kyle was having problems getting comfortable. He's like 6'4 and the beds were not built with tall people in mind. Jess, my wife, got tired of the noise and my fan blowing on her and decided to sleep on the couch in the living room. A couple of hours later, I wake up to Jess screaming for me. I walk into the living room and I see this roaring fire behind the cast iron door. She tells me that she woke up because she heard the handle rattling. Then the door opened of its own accord and a massive fireball billowed out of the fireplace. Then the door latched itself just as I was walking in. I figured whatever ghost was there was just trying to give me a hand, so I went back to bed. The next morning, Kyle ribs me and asks if I had a good night. I asked him what he meant. He told me that he heard bumping against the wall all night and assumed that my wife and I were having fun. We decided it might be best if we didn't stay another night after that, and we left after that evening. To this day, we have no idea what that pounding was. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers in Canada, mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains. 
Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Temagami region during my first year as a counselor. The Temagami region is located between North Bay, Sudbury, and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve. Our route was fairly typical, and beginning in the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling, portaging, hiking, and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day, and in case of emergency. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Until our second to last night, we were having fun and a relatively uneventful time other than some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises. Near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake, which is recognized as part of the Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area, and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250-person population inhabits. We had put out the fire and gone to bed, when about an hour after falling asleep, I was jarred awake by the sound of a loud motorboat. Obviously, this isn't that weird, because it's a large lake, and many people use boats to reach the mainland, or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11 p.m., and things had been quiet for the last few hours. The motor cut out, and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman and they were very angry and yelling at each other, although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far offshore. Suddenly, the woman screamed, and I heard a splash in the water, and then total silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping to God that my girls hadn't woken up. But I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent, and I could tell that they were scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when the whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and onto the tent my girls were in, which immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. The light panned back onto my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of boat with a searchlight on it. After an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat went away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and called our camp director, who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I had given to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night, and I got up at 5 a.m. to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim ashore. Obviously, I didn't find anyone, and there was nothing floating in the water either, although it is a pretty deep body of water. None of us wanted to camp one more night, so I called the camp and had them head out to the pickup point a day early. We paddled like hell and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us wanted to speculate about what we might have heard, and what might have happened if we had made a noise or moved when that light was on our tents. I've thought about this a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've been quite skeptical. I recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but without much luck. Regardless of what we heard, something bad happened that night, and I'm just glad that nothing bad happened to us. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a church that was over a hundred years old. It had been vacant for roughly 45 years. The church is attached to what once was a primary school, which had already been restored into office spaces. 
This was a no-brainer, since it was literally a couple of blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I would always see movement out of my peripheral vision, but nothing was there when I would look in that direction. This happened a lot, to the point where I had become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later, when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I get a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed to the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like power tools running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement toward the noise. I find the cause of the noise, which was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure that I bled all the air before I left earlier that day, and I unplugged it. I looked to see if somebody had plugged it in after me, but it was still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight starts to flicker, and another unplugged power tool turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my fading light at it, the light went out completely. I got out of that basement so fast through complete darkness toward the door. I get out and I see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong as I'm out of breath and clearly freaked out. I tell her what happened and she smirks and says that that doesn't surprise her at all. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child, she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it shut down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately took her own life because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a coworker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked him what happened, he said that he felt like he was pushed. There were even times when the movement that I had always seen started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but still nothing there when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I would always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asks me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me that he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him that they were the only ones there and I began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps in the balcony, and I yelled out, Is anyone still here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I was ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch is nowhere near the door, so you'd have to shut off the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in total darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted toward the door. As I reach for the door, I hear footsteps behind me, and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside the church. I look up and I see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly looked down to ensure that I had locked the door. And by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got out of there. After that night, I made sure that I never entered that building after dark again. Needless to say, I quit shortly thereafter.
Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured that we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I'll be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness meant for backpackers or through hikers looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. As time went on and the Forest Service had other, more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled. Except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling along the river. Ellis and I made it up to the presidential ridge, stopping by the lakes of the clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river, pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, somebody wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly enough, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals no disturbance on the trails or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire along the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this did not last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. 
As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open on the floor. Hey, Ellis, I said. Were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, I passed out, man. It's not like there's anything to read in there anyway, he responded. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backwoods crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on to our way home, not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our stay at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind, I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25-mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40-pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, 
so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, 
as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped. And then, the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry.
This happened during my childhood in Matamoros, Tamaulipas. I lived with my family in a quiet neighborhood where everything went smoothly. I had a happy childhood. Due to the economic situation in the 1970s, many people were forced to migrate to other parts of the country or even to the United States in search of opportunities. For this reason, many houses were abandoned during the moves. It was common for our former neighbors to leave forgotten things behind. So much was the migration in the area that for both my friends and I, one of our favorite games was urban exploration. We would go into the vacant houses with the desire to search through the garbage to see what kind of objects had been left behind. Of course, our main objective was toys. As we explored the adjoining houses, we had to expand to the point that we already had to ride a bicycle to find more abandoned houses. On one occasion, I don't remember the date, we were not five blocks from our houses when we saw an uninhabited house. It already had the for rent sign and several large bags with forgotten objects had been left in the garage. We started to rummage through the bags, but among some crap, one of my friends found the head of a doll, one of those that open and close the eyes. The head was that of a baby, it had no hair, and had a happy expression, but when you were staring at it, you felt this inexplicable discomfort. It was very striking, as if someone wanted to tear it to pieces with an ice pick. Between jokes and games, we decided to take it with us, and we put it on a tree that was at the entrance of some soccer fields we used to go to. Since that day, we felt a very ugly vibe, in addition to being able to feel a heavy glance and stare. But not everything ends here, because for some strange reason, we were very attracted to it, so much that we even quarreled. I fought with my friend because I wanted to take it to my house and not leave it there. But the greed had not only erupted in me, but in all of my friends, each of us wanting to take it. Such was the extent of our disputes that there were days when we didn't speak. I felt a certain responsibility since I was the one who had started everything. So after reconsidering, I went to look for my friends to apologize to them, and everything returned to normal. On one occasion, we were playing marbles, and Mario, my best friend, exclaimed, scared, the little head rolled its eyes. But since we already knew that it could open and close them, we did not give it importance. But Mario insisted again, then we saw that the toy did not just open and close its eyes, but moved them from side to side and even blinked. Of course, we ran away in terror and we never stepped onto that soccer field again. After a few days, we got together again and decided what we were going to do with that thing. We had to get rid of it, but nobody had the courage to touch it. So we decided to go with an adult friend. Two streets from where we lived, there was the house of a man named Valentin. He was very kind and used to play soccer with us. We knew his children, who were younger than us, because we had been invited to his birthday parties previously. We went to look for him. We knew at what time we could find him and we told him everything. Obviously, he did not believe us. We took him to the soccer field to show him the head. He took it, carefree, and watched it closely for a few minutes. Then he said, I'm taking it home. My daughter has some of her headless dolls. It will help me fix one. So he took the head, put it in a grocery bag, and took it home. Days passed without incident, and the tranquility returned in our circle of friends. In fact, we decided it might be safe to return to the soccer field. However, 15 days had passed since we last saw Valentin, and we had never heard from him since. So, we went to go look for him at his house. We got to his house, and we were playing for half an hour, but nobody opened it. We could hear that the TV was on, and we could see lights on inside the house. Even his truck was parked in the garage, but he would not come out to greet us. This seemed very strange to us. The subsequent days that we went to look for him, the same thing happened, and we still did not hear from Valentin or his family. 
We discussed the situation with our parents and neighbors, but they didn't care. In fact, my mother told me that perhaps they had to emigrate like all the others. Concerned about this situation and without help from the adults, we decided to investigate on our own. We jumped over the fence and went inside his house. When we entered, we found the lights on in some rooms. The television was also on. And, in fact, the dinner plates were still on the table, and the food was still there. It honestly seemed as if all the family had just vanished, since all their belongings were there. Their clothes, children's toys, even his wallet was up on the television next to his car keys. We left everything as it was and left the house with great fear, sensing that something bad had happened to them. We tried to see how to file a disappearance complaint with the police, but this was impossible since we were minors, and when we were finally able to convince our parents to support us, the complaint could not be taken since we weren't related to them. Thus, the days became weeks, months, and we didn't stop searching. On one occasion, I was returning from school. I saw that there were people in Valentine's house. Thinking it was him, my heart filled with joy, and I ran to meet him. But when I reached the threshold of the door, I saw that they were different people. These people were family members who came after not hearing from them. The man said that he was Valentine's brother-in-law. After introducing myself to him, he asked me questions to find out if I knew anything about Valentine's whereabouts. I replied no. I accompanied him to ask the neighbors if they knew anything. And finally, a neighbor could give a reason. An old woman who lived in the house across the street told Valentine's brother-in-law that a few months ago, after nine o'clock at night, she heard a piercing scream that woke her up, and as the window of her room faces the street, she leaned out to see what had happened, but didn't see anything strange. Minutes later, she saw that Valentine rushed out and started the truck. Immediately after, he ran back to the house, and after that she didn't know. The woman said that the car's engine was on all night, and around one in the morning, she heard the engine turn off. When the lady went out to carry out her daily activities in the morning, she saw the truck was still there, and when she heard the television on, she thought everything was fine. But ever since then, she's never heard from Valentine or his family. With the passage of time, Valentine's house also became an uninhabited house. For respect, we never went back in. However, other people did. First, the truck disappeared, then the appliances. Furniture was stolen, until it was completely empty. Over the years, the property was auctioned off, and new tenants came to live. My friends and I grew up, and each one made his own life. But to this day, I've never stopped wondering what happened to Valentine and his family, and if that doll's head had something to do with their disappearance. One day, I went to my friend Nicole's house with my friend Crystal. While I was there, Nicole tells me this story and asks what I think it is. For anonymity, I'll change out some names, and for context, Nicole, Nicole's boyfriend John, and Crystal all work together. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I'm curious as to what you think. Nicole parked her car at work one day and saw John and Crystal having a smoke together. John was facing Nicole, and Crystal was facing John with her back to Nicole. Nicole went upstairs to her desk, and everyone was asking where Crystal was. She said she was downstairs, having a smoke with John. John comes up and goes to his desk. She asks him where Crystal was, and he said he didn't know. She asked him who he was standing with, and he said no one. Nicole then gets a text from Crystal, saying she was going to be late and could she tell their boss. Nicole starts freaking out because she knows she saw Crystal downstairs. 
She described her in detail, hair up in a top knot, white long-sleeved shirt, black leggings and black sandals, with her purse hanging from her right elbow. To be clear, Crystal was just married and John is not her type, so that can be eliminated as a possibility of lying and cheating. I asked Crystal what she was doing while Nicole saw her with John, and she said she was sleeping at home. She also said that she lost those black sandals on vacation a few months back. My mind goes to a few places. Number one, how stressed are you? Your mind can play tricks if you're not feeling well. Two, astral projection, since Crystal was sleeping. Three, residual energy, since this is something that happens frequently. Four, Crystal's mother? Crystal is the spitting image of her mom. Her mom passed many years ago. John's dad went into the hospital the evening I was there, and the event happened a few days prior. Or a doppelganger wearing the missing shoes. Now something else super freaky happened that night when I was at her place. The night she told me this story. I was getting ready to read Nicole's tarot cards and I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. When I came back, Nicole had my cards out already and was shuffling. Anyone who is familiar with tarot knows that you do not touch the cards until they're handed to you, and she had never done this before. I did leave them out for that crazy moon about a month ago, and they've gotten a lot stronger from it, so their pull to touch them is overwhelming. But still, she knows better. I had previously explained the rules to her of how I read tarot for everyone's safety, so I have no idea what possessed her to do that. I sat and took them back and began to shuffle, but the energy was off, like really off. Her dog was chill all night, but the second I began to lay her cards, after giving them back for her to shuffle, he began to bark at the sliding door that led to her balcony. We're talking over 10 stories here, so no one is there. No birds, no other animals, nothing. I started to become unsettled since the off feeling was getting stronger. We tried to shush him and settle him, but nothing was working. I decided to put the cards away since there was something amiss going on. From what I saw of her reading, it was a very good one, but there was something else stopping me from reading her. I urged her to smudge the house and everyone in it, and once that was done, I felt better. The next day, I am so freaking sick. Coughing, sore throat, nauseous, weak body. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't drink anything. This lasted for two days and I'm on the mend now, but still not 100%. So what in the world did she see? What was going on? Does anyone have any idea? I am at a total loss. I'm definitely not going to touch my cards until I'm 100% well again and do a cleansing on them. I will eventually ask the question, but I wonder if you may have some input as to what happened that night and what Crystal saw before.